this is also uh, an insufficiency fracture of the uh, medial tibial flat two, uh, very subtle low signal, subchondral signal intensity in the medial tibial flat two, which can be better seen when you uh, focus on that area right here. Low signal intensity on both T1 and T2 rated images. Um, also known as SONC. Medial femoral condyle, as you know, is the most common site, and uh, medial tibial flat 2 is the next common site. The fracture line itself may not be seen in most of the cases. All you see is marrow edema, and this low signal, subchondral low signal, really is the key. Okay. Now this was um, actually not so obvious. This was one of the cases where I had to scratch my head a little bit. This again happened while I was in an outpatient center um, reading everything. <coughs> yes, that's part of the but the patient had an acute uh, injury and came with swelling and pain. And uh, okay, and why do you say that? Like, let me show you the cinema. Okay. So by looking at the confusion pattern, um, is there anything in the confusion pattern that? But there was no confusion in the patella. Let me show you once again. There is definitely confusion in the femoral condyle, lateral femoral condyle, but patella, the medial patella does really doesn't have much going on there. And that's what bothered me because everything else fit. And what does this image? these um, four images show. Is there anything additional that you can gain from these sagittal images? You're absolutely right. I mean, that's the diagnosis, but <laughs> we don't want to stop there because we have to make all the findings, right? So there is also a cartilaginous loose body. There is a tiny fragment um, sitting right next to the femoral condyle, and I wanted to figure out where this came from, and I kept looking at the inferior and medial um, patellar facet. That is where most, you know, most of the times you get osteochondral uh, injury, um, and I couldn't find anything going on in the patella, and maybe this fragment is from the femoral condyle itself. Regardless, there is a cartilage, cartilaginous loose body, and that's also something important as a radiologist that we want to um, let our orthopod colleagues know. And like you said before, the trochlea is very flat. Once again, the transient uh, lateral patellar dislocations happen with, um, you know, uh, this maltracking of the patella either due to trochlear dysplasia or the um, <coughs> patella or patella os or some kind of patellar abnormality. So, um, once again, here you see there is really nothing going on in the medial. 
aspect of the patella, and that's what was kind of uh, unusual about this case. So this is, like you said, transient patellar dislocation. And the con bone contusion pattern in the lateral femoral condyle is uh, characteristic and is different from the ACL contusion pattern. It is more anterior and elongated, more like rectangular shape. Um, that's because when the lateral subluxation occurs, um, there is, you know, the medial patella engages the anterior corner of the lateral patellar condyle, and that's where the osteochondral injuries occur. And you also want to look for um, MPFL uh, tears and edema, although in this particular case there was not a uh, obvious tear of the medial retinaculum or MPFL. Okay, so this is moving down to the ankle. 42-year-old with, again, somewhat chronic lateral ankle pain, axial proton density and T2 weighted images, and sagittal T1. Any takers on this one? What's the structure here? The anterior talofibula looks somewhat thickened and there is all this soft tissue in the region of the, in and around the region of the anterior talofibular ligament. And look at this large amount of soft tissue. Normally it is just fat and um, this is a ton of proliferative tissue in the anterolateral gutter. So this is uh, anterolateral ankle impingement. And uh, this, this is not that uncommon, uh, especially after um, several months after an immersion injury. Um, the anterolateral recess is between the tibia fibula and the um, ankle joint capsule superiorly bounded by the inferior syndesmotic ligaments and inferiorly by the anterior talofibular ligaments. So either injury of the um, ankle collateral ligaments or anterior talofibular ligaments or the syndesmotic ligaments can uh, cause some soft tissue proliferation and limit dorsiflexion and, you know, every time the patient tries to dorsiflex, there is um, this tissue that gets uh, kind of squeezed between and causes pain and uh, patient points to anterolateral ankle, especially if the pain corresponds to the um, finding, you know, that's, uh, oops, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know how that happened. Hmm. Yeah. This is a great article on ankle impingement uh, syndromes by Rosenberg, um, not uh, and not too long ago. Um, there are other ankle impingement syndrome. Anterior ankle impingement syndrome can happen when you have uh, bone spurs anteriorly from the tibia and also the talus. Usually in capsular injuries, you can get bone spurs eventually. And when there is a decreased angle between the two, again, patient has pain in, on dorsiflexion. You can also have posterior ankle impingement syndrome, as you know, um, such as Ostrigonum syndrome, postromedial and anteromedial impingement syndromes are less common and less known, uh, usually from deltoid injury. A 60-year-old male with 
heel pains, once again chronic in nature, no acute injury. Uh, I, someone online said sinus tarsi syndrome. Not really. I don't think patient does not have pain in the region of the sinus tarsi. But I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Calcaneo navicular coalition. Um, I can see why you were saying that, but not really, uh, because let me show you. There is no marrow edema in the calcaneo navicular joint which you would expect. Here is the calcaneonavicular joint, right? So I don't think so. It was more posterior. Sinus tarsi, let me show you since someone mentioned, is here. Okay, retrocalcaneal bursitis, someone online said that. Yes, there is retrocalcaneal bursitis. There's also something else. Okay, yes. So. Someone said Haglin syndrome, that's true. So what we have is we don't have much of Achilles tendinopathy except this linear signal in the deep portion of the Achilles tendon, right? But there is um, marrow edema adjacent to the Achilles insertion. And there is also increased fluid in the retrocalcaneal bursa. So this triad is also called Haglin syndrome or pump bump, I mean, this may not happen that much. At least when we were here, we were not wearing these kind of shoes before, although I have seen these nowadays. So uh, this is one of the prizes we women pay <laughs> for looking good. So uh, what happens is, uh, you know, there, there is constant friction in this region, and uh, <coughs> you can get edema and inflammation um, in the uh, region of the retrocalcaneal bursa and Achilles tendinopathy. Okay, this is a 64-year-old with foot pain. Once again, no history of acute injury, uh, but the um, symptoms are fairly acute. I'm sorry? Yes, but the pain is not there. Okay, now I guess it's clear. <laughs> so 10 days later, patient continued to have pain. So what's happening here? Yeah, there is a stress factor of the third metatarsal and you can even see some uh, 10 days later there is this low signal intensity here right around the fracture site which could represent some callus formation and if you go back here right like there is the most subtle fracture oops sorry in the third metatarsal but you know, it was not picked up when the patient came for an MRI. And 10 days later, well, they could also have done this uh, repeated an x-ray, right? So you can also see the fracture on the x-rays. Nineteen-year-old with, again, no history of acute trauma or injury. With medial pain, you can see the markers placed where the pain is, especially in foot. Yes. Right, absolutely. So it's an os navicular syndrome. What type of os navicular is this? Type 3? Uh, it's type 2. Type 3 is when uh, the os completely fuses to the tubercle. Yes, but you're absolutely right. Um, one thing about foot and ankle imaging, when you are imaging the patient, please ha ask your technologist to place uh, a marker, especially if the patient is pointing to a specific area of pain and it can be very helpful for you because you see a lot of 
findings, right? But you are not going to treat the findings. You are going to treat the patient. So um, if the if the findings correspond to the you know what the patient is complaining, then you know you can conclusively say this is what is happening. I find that uh, helpful, especially in the foot and ankle imaging, because you know foot and ankle. Uh, is probably the most beaten up part of our body, and there's going to be like a lot of little findings, uh, inflammatory stuff, uh, tenosynovitis, and whatnot. So having a marker is really helpful. So anyway, going back, what you see here, as one of you already mentioned, is a lot of edema at the synchondrosis of this. Os naviculari, there is also pseudoarthrosis as you can see. And what is thought to be is due to repetitive motion and microtrauma, you can get inflammatory changes and a patient can have pain. And you can also get uh, posterior tibial tendon pathology in this type of os naviculari. Type, this is a type 2, this, uh, and these are the ones that tend to be become symptomatic. Type 1 is a small os, which is completely intratendinous, and type 3 is a very protuberant tuberosity when it has completely fused. Okay, um, this was a fairly interesting case. A uh, 12 year old with hip pain, uh, acute pain after fall. And we saw this x-ray, didn't see much. And the pain was on the left. Okay. Here is a cine. Left pain. Let me show you everything. So these are the axial images. I guess you have the diagnosis now. So this was Interesting in the sense, let's go back to the plain zone. Typically, um, you know, uh, teenagers, adults, and uh, age group is the one where you get apophyseal injuries and apophyseal avulsions. In this pa in this patient, you don't have ossification of the ischial apophysis, so you really can't see anything on the X-ray. However, I to me, I thought the axial images were really very helpful. And when you do a hip imaging, I'm not sure what your protocol is. You really want to do the um, side of the hip, like just one hip at a time, um, where the pain is. So you, we do some large field of view images and then concentrate on the hip in question and do small field of view, coronal, sagittal, and axial images because you want to get as high a resolution as possible. What we're seeing here is you can see that this, this is the apophysis. This is just completely slid off of the ischium right here. And there is all this fluid signal here. And again, here is the ischial apophysis. These are the hamstring tendons here. The tendons themselves look normal, right? Like it is just the apophysis is completely pulled off. Here is the um, the anterior tendon. Is which one? That's the semimembranosus tendon, and the more posterior tendon is the conjoint tendon or the tendon of the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus. So that's. This is a complete avulsion of the ischial apophysis. Once again, here is the conjoint tendon, 
semimembranosus tendon. The tendons themselves are intact. And there is a little bit of adductor edema here, adductor muscle edema. So this is apophyseal injury, um, <coughs> apophyseal avulsion, which could not be diagnosed on x-ray because there it was still not ossified. I think it starts ossification around 13, so he was right at the, you know, at that age where it hadn't started yet. So just to review, this this is the normal configuration of the hamstring tendons attaching to the ischial tuberosity. Uh, once again, the blue arrow pointing to the semimembranosus, the red arrow pointing to the conjoint tendon and the sciatic nerve. And this is the, another patient, adult patient, where the apophysis is fused. A marathon runner, and here, what do we see here? We have chronic tendinopathy of the semimembranosus tendon, and also probably a partial tear. And you also have reactive marrow edema of the ischial tuberosity. So, in adult patients where the apophysis is fused, um, the tendon abnormalities and tendon avulsions are common. And in uh, the younger age group where the apophysis is still not fused, apophyseal injury is common. So, in um, patients with hip imaging and um, hip pain, once you have ruled out your Typical, um, you know, AVN and fractures uh, concentrate on the tendons and uh, uh, bursae, and um, also now with 3D imaging, we can also see the acetabular labral um, pathologies. Well, so those are the things you want to look for when you're looking at a hip. 52-year-old with right hip pain. Okay. Any takers on this one? What about this fluid here? Okay, let me see if I have one more. So what tendon is this? This is the iliopsoas tendon. This is the iliopsoas bursa, which is filled with fluid. And um, one of the largest bursae in the body um, communicates with the hip joint. This is iliopsoas bursitis. Not that uncommon. You can say it, see it in patients with inflammatory arthropathies, uh, degenerative hip, and also it's fairly uh, commonly seen in patients who have had hip arthroplasties also. Here's on this one. I'm sorry? Um, actually, we don't, these are posterior images, right? I mean, we really don't have much of biceps because, uh, let me find my, this is the infraspinatus here. So we are coming from posterior to anterior and, uh, let me, and here is the, the bottom left image here, that's the supraspinatus there. So really, you are not seeing biceps, and I mean, maybe you're seeing a little bit of biceps there. 
So what what do we have here? I'm sorry? Kill tax. Well, uh, it is a good location, right? Calcific tendonite is someone online mentioned that. That's what this is. You can see the blooming artifact, susceptibility artifact. It is dark. On, that's why you have both sequences. You have T1-weighted sequence and fluid-sensitive sequence, fat suppressed. And it's dark, dark. There are only a few things that remain dark in all pulse sequences, right? So, um, and you have a little bit of a blooming artifact here. And actually, this looks larger than the normal um, thickness of the tendon. So this is um, HADD or calcific tendonitis. This is a, another case of the same. Um, the um, plain cone showing some calcification actually uh, in the anterior aspect near the biceps, subscapularis. Here you see instead of, um, you know, obvious calcification that you saw in the infraspinatus tendon. In the other case, you see a lot of inflammatory changes. As you know, calcific uh, tendonitis uh, can have different phases and also can have uh, varying symptoms. And that's why uh, imaging can be helpful. Here you have a lot of inflammatory changes all along the biceps sheet and um, around the subscapularis. Same patient, again, you see inflammatory changes along the biceps tendon. Um, this was a uh, poster presentation in the last RSNA one of my colleagues did, uh, which uh, the diagrams nicely illustrate, and um, you can read for yourself. I'm not going to repeat that, uh, that they can have varying presentations, and these um, you know, the etiology of calcific tendonitis is not quite well understood, but we do know that they can have acute symptoms and excruciating pain, and especially the symptoms can be exacerbated when these calcific deposits migrate into the bursae or they can even um, migrate intraosseously and cause um, tremendous marrow edema. And here are some examples of those. Uh, this is the intraosseous extension having a lot of reactive marrow edema. And they can also rupture into the bursa, causing um, you know, acute exacerbation of pain. OK. K1-weighted images, coronal images. Again, uh, chronic symptoms. Okay, absolutely. So everyone can appreciate that there is fatty replacement and atrophy of the teres minor, which means, which can be usually seen in quadrilateral face syndrome, right, uh, which is uh, axillary uh, compression um, or compressive neuropathies of the, one of the compressive neuropathies of the shoulder. You can either get isolated teres minor atrophy in the quadrilateral face syndrome or um, deltoid can also be involved. Um, what is quadrilateral space? Axillary nerve and the um, posterior circumflex humeral artery traverse through the space, which is bounded superiorly by the teres major, inferiorly by teres minor, and then um, triceps medially and the humeral um, uh, shaft laterally, as you can see. Um, not to be mistaken with other compression neuropathies, um, you, you know, there are other uh, neuropathies in the shoulder. Suprascapular uh, syndrome, nerve syndrome is another one um, where it involves the intra and supraspinatus muscles, both are isolated depending on where the um, compression is. You can also get 
Parsonage uh, Turner syndrome, uh, where the difference between uh, quadrilateral cell space syndrome and Parsonage Turner syndrome sometimes can be difficult. Um, but in Parsonage uh, Turner syndrome, it's acute brachial plexopathy, and more than one nerve can be involved. So if you just have isolated tris, uh, I mean teres minor, such as in this case, uh, yeah, and the symptoms are chronic, it's usually quadrilateral space syndrome. And you, and typically, these are due to fibrous bands. So you may not see um, labral cyst, such as you in suprascapular nerve compression. Uh, that's the most common reason for suprascapular nerve compression. Here in MRI imaging, you may not see the cause of quadrilateral space syndrome, but you'll see the result of it. OK. What type of study is this? OK. Okay. Coronal and axial images showing what type of um I don't think it's Beaufort's <laughs> complex. Uh, let me explain where we are. Like here is the biceps tendon, right? Here is the biceps um, labral um, attachment. And you have contrast undercutting the labrum here. And more posteriorly, as you go more posteriorly, there is still um, signal or contrast getting in under the labrum. And this is going even more posteriorly. So this is a very long uh, <coughs> slap lesion. And also there is an anterior labral tear, anterior inferior labral tear. This is an extensive labral tear, as um, some of the online people also mentioned. So. Here is the superior component of the tear. So flap lesions are usually um, confined to the superior labrum and from anterior to inferior. And depending on the displacement of the tear, they can they are divided, and also the extent of the tear, they are divided anywhere between 1 to 9. But one to four is the classic one. The one we had here was, was at least a type three tear in addition to the anterior inferior labral tear. And as you know, the um, glenoid cavity is uh, shaped like, uh, depending on who you talk to, is shaped like a pear or, uh, you know, people talk about different kinds of fruits. But regardless, it is. Uh, divided into these uh, clock positions. And when you describe the tear, you can describe the extent of the tear uh, and refer to the clock position. So uh, the arthropod knows what you're talking about. This is a more subtle case. Um, th again, this patient, um, it's just chronic in the sense of few months, but it kind of started suddenly. And patient has limited range of motion. Any takers on this one? Of what? We don't. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, there is definitely some AC joint stuff going on. Anything else? But the tendon itself is not torn, is it? 
although I haven't shown you the very distal portion of the tendon. Okay, someone is talking about a ligament. What kind of ligament are we talking about? Where are we here? We are in the region of the rotator interval. This here is the co coracoid process. Oops. Coracoid process here, coracoid process, right? And let me use this. Here is the coracohumeral ligament. And the coracohumeral ligament should be usually a thin. Whereas in this case, it is really thickened. And if on the T2-weighted images, you can see that there is mild inflammatory changes around the coracoclavicular ligament. So this is the region of the rotator interval. And um, be sure to look at, especially when you don't see a tear or significant tendinopathy and the patient's pain is disproportionate to what you're seeing, uh, look carefully at the rotator interval, coracohumeral ligament, and also the axillary recess. And thickening and inflammatory changes in these regions um, are indicative of adhesive capsulitis. Uh, clinically, you know, it is uh, actually a lesion of, um, you know, it's, uh, you have to exclude all other things, and uh, it is a um, diagnosis of exclusion. And I can vouch for you, it can be extremely painful and mimic um, rotator cuff tears. Uh, I can tell you with such an experience because I had a capsulitis and ended up with acute pain and was which was thought to be a tough tear but ended up being a capsulitis. So the uh, MR um, imaging findings can be quite subtle like this even though the patient has excruciating pain. Okay. Okay, well, um, there is a lot of fluid, isn't it? There is, and there is also intraarticular fluid. There is a big joint effusion. Oops. Not only there is big joint effusion, there are a few tiny erosions. And it's not a simple effusion, is it? Like you would normally see. There is intermediate signal intensity of the synovium indicating synovial thickening, um, synovial inflammation. By no means this is a um, slam dunk diagnosis, but uh, along with clinical history, you can uh, reasonably make this diagnosis, although this is not the way that you diagnose rheumatoid arthritis, but in early cases when there is when the diagnosis is in question, this can help. In very early cases where you don't have synovial thickening, you can also give contrast and look for synovial enhancement. More than in diagnosis, um, sometimes people follow these patients uh, to look for response for therapy. Uh, to see if the disease has uh, stabilized and th that there is to make sure that there is no progression of disease. And you can see these tiny uh, erosions uh, very nicely on the MRI and uh, the X-ray, as you can see, really has um, not much of a, um, you know, uh, change except that there is joint effusion. Starting on your old with medial pain, and you can see the marker where the pain is. Anything here? Well, there are some. There is there is some um, edema in the medial aspect around the cubital tunnel. And here is the ulnar nerve. 
which shows mildly increased signal and that's you know it's pretty close to where the pain is so um, there is ulnar nerve thickening and um, edema someone said leprosy we don't see leprosy in the US at least so uh, it's mostly secondary to overuse and the symptom is, you know, very specific only in this region in this patient. So um, this is cubital tunnel syndrome. Uh, again, it can be it, it's an overuse syndrome, and you see that more and more these days. Uh, you know, what with the use of uh, mouse for 12 hours a day, especially as radiologists. Um, cubital tunnel passes through. Uh, I mean, um, ulnar nerve passes through. Uh, some tight spaces and there are three areas where you can get compression neuropathy of the ulnar nerve. Cubital tunnel is the most common one. Uh, more proximally you can get the comp get compression in the um, region of the arcade of feathers which is like a band which goes across the ulnar nerve from the intermuscular septum to the triceps and the ulnar nerve travels underneath it. And again, cubital tunnel, as you know, is a fibroaceous tunnel between olecranon, medial epicondyle, and also the um, cubital retinaculum. And more distally, it can get trapped between the heads of the um, flexor ulnaris um, in the um, pronator aponeurosis. So those are the three uh, areas where it can get compressed, but cubital tunnel is the most common one. Okay, home stretch, just a few more. Which side? Okay, good. So this is a very classic case of lateral epicondylitis and you have thickening of the common extensor tendon and maybe even fluid undercutting the um, origin of the common extensor so maybe there's a tiny partial tear but the uh, lateral collateral ligament looks intact. In severe cases of lateral epicondylitis, you can also get uh, tears of the, you know, if it continues, if you, you can get tears of the lateral collateral ligament, also known as tennis elbow. So medial and lateral epicondylitis are one of the common reasons that we, and that patients go on to get MRI and uh, can be, you know, easily diagnosed on MRI such as this one. As you can see here, there is a little bit of a fluid signal which indicates partial tearing. And uh, the tearing usually um, occurs, uh, usually the extensor carpi radialis brevis is the one uh, most commonly involved, although it can extend to the um, other origins of the extensor muscles. Okay. Chronic pain. Okay, I'm going to go backwards. Okay. Decline stenosynovitis. Let me see what the online people are saying. Uh, I'm gonna oops, go one more time here. Obviously, I want to hear something else, right? Decline stenosynovitis is stenosynovitis of what compartment? I'm sorry? Extensor which one? Yes. It is extra one, compartment one, right? Same patient. So what we have here, if you notice, 
Yeah, I believe it is the Mr. Tubercle here, right? Right there. And these are the second compartment tendons, which are the extensor carpid radials, longus, and brevis. And this side is the third compartment tendon. Watch what happens here. So second compartment tendon, third compartment tendon. Same. This is coming across here. Third compartment tendon. Second compartment tendon. So there is tenus is and this is, keep watching, it's going across. Third compartment tendon. And same thing here, see here? This is the extensor pollicis crossing over the second compartment tendons, the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. So this right here, this is distal intersection syndrome. In the uh, wrist, there are six extensor compartments, as you know. And the uh, tendons cross over one another in two areas. One in the distal forearm, proximal to the retinacle, extensor retinaculum, um, where the first compartment tendon, abductor pollicis longus, which is illustrated here, crosses over the second compartment tendon and can cause tenosynovitis secondary to overuse friction and whatnot. That is called the proximal intersection syndrome. And the first case that we saw was the distal intersection syndrome where the third compartment tendon, the extensor pollicis, crosses over the second one. I think this is kind of difficult to comprehend when you just see selected images if you haven't really seen this um, type of pathology. So just to kind of review, uh, this is a nice illustration in uh, rat source. What we have here, just notice when you look at the Lister's tubercle, we are too far distal to the uh, proximal intersection syndrome. So here you have the extensor pollicis crossing over. These two are the uh, extensor radialis tendons. And here is the first compartment muscle and tendons crossing over the second compartment tendons that is more proxim proximal to the wrist joint, proximal to the extensor red maculum. So this, I mean, if you see tenosynovitis here, that's the proximal intersection syndrome. Uh, tenosynovitis more distally uh, in and around the region of the distal, I mean, Mr. tubercle is the distal intersection syndrome. And then tenosynovitis of the first compartment is decluorine. So um, that's location and what's involved. So you just have to scroll back and forth and see, you know, where these changes are occurring. So once again, um, these intersection syndromes are seen more often these days uh, in people like uh, software engineers and maybe radiologists too. So um, with that, I'm going to close and thanks a lot for listening.